Throughout history, people with deep faith have done some unusual things. John the Baptist wore camel hair and ate locusts and honey. Isaiah the prophet was told to preach naked for three years. And my guest today hasn't worn shoes or socks since 2010 because of his passion for his spiritual mission. Jeff Brodsky, thanks for joining us. <laughs> thanks. How do you like that intro? Well, I'm just glad that God didn't ask me to go naked for three years. <laughs> if I say me too, that's going to sound insulting, so I won't say that. But I know people want to know, but we're going to make him wait because I think, you know, okay. they, they, they need to watch the rest of this interview and then we're going to tell you why he's not wearing shoes. <laughs> but, but your spiritual mission really started with a clown called Snuggles. Tell me about him. Snuggles the love clown. Um, I was uh, the clown character for over 20 years. God actually showed me a way that I could share the entire story of Jesus, his birth, death, and resurrection without saying a word. As a result, it opened up any country in the world because I could travel anywhere, share the whole story. What I would do is I had this thing called Snuggles Pocket Circus. I had these huge pockets in my clown costume, so I put everything in my pockets. I would stand on a street corner, start juggling, could be in Calcutta, India, wherever I was, Africa, so many different nations, and within minutes I would have a crowd of hundreds. Well, we always worked along with local missionaries, and the missionaries would have a bullhorn, and I would just do about a 15-minute program, and then the missionaries would say, come tonight, well, in their language, uh, see uh, Snuggles the Love Clown from America, the big show tonight, free. And that evening I would do a 90-minute to two-hour program, and at the end of the program, the last half hour, I did the presentation um, where I showed the entire story of Jesus. I never spoke as a clown, um, but after I finished clowning, I would then take off my makeup in front of everyone, and I've now earned the right to be heard. Mm. It's not like here in America where they see a clown like Ronald McDonald or Bozo or whoever. They see the art form of, of what I did. Now I've earned the right to be heard, so using an interpreter, we would then, after I did the whole presentation, I would then talk to them a bit, give an invitation. We saw somewhere between three to 400,000 salvations through mm -hmm. that presentation. Amazing, and you know, this really started you on a journey to try to find the least of these in the yes. world. Because you know, I know this from my own travels in the developing world, every time you think you've seen the worst, there's always somebody in a worse situation that breaks your heart even more. Sure, well when I, you know, I ministered uh, as Snuggles, uh, the greatest audience that I ever had, without question, um, <laughs> was in the, the village of Jamshedpur, India. It was actually the day before I, I got an invitation by Mother Teresa to visit her in her home for the destitute and dying in Calcutta. And it was a leper colony. And here people with stumps applauding and smiling with half faces. The greatest audience I ever had without question. Mm. I thought, boy, you can't get any lower than this because this was a part of the search that I did for the least of these. Uh, the that's why I titled my book what I did. Um, but. That journey would not end until I learned of the plight of children that were trafficked for sexual exploitation and forced to work in brothels. And when I say children, Cheryl, I'm talking when I went undercover, we found children in brothels as young as four years old. There is no worse crime perpetrated against a child since the dawn of creation. Nobody can convince me of it. This shoulder has, uh, has captured the the tears of too many children, uh, hearing their stories, n uh, having to service. I don't have to paint a picture uh, for the viewers of what that means. Having to service 10, 15, up to 20 men a day. Um, there, it's a nightmare what's happening in our world. And it's not just overseas. Um, it's any country, uh, whether it be uh, overseas in Asia, Africa, Central or South America, uh, uh, the United States or here in Canada. It doesn't matter. Where there's men and girls, it's happening. Yeah, and God actually gave you an experience that really transformed your life even further. He gave, let you experience for seven seconds what it feels like to be abused as a child. Tell me about that. It's hard to talk about because of what I experienced that night. I woke up in the middle of the night and I was an emotional basket case. And my wife woke up and she said, "Hun, what's wrong? And I said, uh, I can't talk, I just have to, I have to go pray. And for the rest of the night I went into another room and I laid down, uh, face down, prostrate before God, pouring up my heart. 
I'm pouring my heart out to him. I, I didn't understand what was going on. My wife woke up that morning. She came out. She said, "Hun, what happened?" And I said, "Hun, I don't know if it was real or a dream, but for about seven seconds, God gave me the emotion of what one of these children feel while they're being ravaged." I said, "My life as I know it is over." I said, "As long as, as long as a child is being uh, abused this way." I'm going to devote the rest of my life to rescuing as many as I can. You know, it's interesting, Cheryl, the different things that we pray for. Uh, we pray for the gift of healing or miracles. I have pleaded with God, God, just give me one gift. Give me the ability to take my finger and touch someone, especially a man, and let them feel what I felt for those seven seconds. Um, they would have such a different understanding of what they're doing to these children uh, or teens or young women. Uh, I think a woman could understand why he did that to me. I don't know. Maybe it was because he knew it would cause me to become as zealous as I am. I don't think he needed to do that for it to happen. But when I think about that experience, um, it, it does motivate me to continue what I'm doing um, in a way that is it's indescribable. I just can't put it into words what I felt that that for those seven seconds. I don't think there's any way to describe the horror of that unless you've lived it or had the the gift, I guess you could call it, that you had. You know, that sent you undercover mm -hmm. into many brothels around the world. What has that experience been like? Because I know people who've done that uh, almost have a form of PTSD. As you know, a when I first began, um, when I first began this. Uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew what I wanted to do and what I believed God was calling me to do. So I went undercover. Uh, there was a time where we would go into dozens of brothels with a team that I was working with in India. And we would have hidden cameras. It could be a button, it could be a pen, my glasses. Uh, we would get the footage of children. We would bring it to the police. The next day the police would go and do a raid and nobody was there. And, you know, this would happen time and time. It was costing us tens of thousands of dollars, thinking, God, there has to be a better way. Well, fortunately, he showed me that better way. Um, it took years, and that's one of the things that we're doing now uh, with an organization called AIM that you know about, uh, with Don and Bridget Brewster in Cambodia, uh, Cambodia mm -hmm. <coughs> training their SWAT teams and the anti-trafficking uh, juvenile protection police. We have special teams now that are highly skilled, highly trained, that go in there to do uh, training uh, for those uh, police and SWAT teams, yeah, I... which has resulted just last year alone. There were over 300 rescues from teams that we trained. So the partnership that we have with AIM is phenomenal. Um, I think it's imperative that people that are fighting child or teen trafficking join forces. We must put away jealousy, envy, fear Absolutely. that, wait, if I uh, introduce my constituents to this organization, what if they give to them instead of us? So what? As long as it, as long as it accomplishes the end result that we look for. for sure. I don't care who gets the credit for rescues. I only care about two things. Girl gets rescued. God gets the glory. Yeah. That's what's most important. Absolutely. It's such important work you do. Now, I am going to finally, we're going to tell people about your okay. bare feet. Quickly, we only have 30 seconds left. So tell me about why you've been going bare feet since 2010. July 19, 2010, I was at a garbage dump in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. We were feeding uh, children that live in the dump because that's where the fresh food is. When I went to my hotel room that night, I had a conversation with God. I couldn't get the picture of those bare feet. All the children there were barefoot except for two that had old flip-flops. I had a conversation with God, and I felt that he was impressing on me to go barefoot in solidarity with those children. I thought, God, I live at 9,000 feet elevation. What would I do in the winter? In Colorado. And he showed me that he would protect me as long as I use wisdom and, uh, and not, don't become an idiot, and I have to be careful. Well, I, I, went to, I committed to one year. That one year anniversary, July 19, 2011, this is what happened. I put my left foot on my ottoman, at 2.30 in the morning, I had a sock. I just wanted to, I haven't had a sock on my feet in over eight and a half years. I put the sock on my toes, went to pull it. It was as if there was a tug of war and I couldn't get that sock past my toes. And I cried out and said, God, what do you want from me? I just went for a whole year. And these are the words that I heard. Keep going. Those children are still out there. And 
I made the decision that as long as my going barefoot would motivate even one person a year to action in a way that would help me to rescue even one more child a year, I would go barefoot the rest of my life. Wow. And it's been that way ever since. Love your heart. I love the work that you do. Your ministry is Joy International. Joy International. The book is the least of these. It's a gripping book. Tells so much more of your story than we could tell here. Jeff Brodsky, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I really appreciate the time it's been with a you, pleasure. Cheryl. A genuine pleasure.